Robert, what led you to take on the story of Linda Johnson? Well, I, uh, this is a story I've wanted to tell for a long time. I, uh, having grown up here in Austin, uh, my father uh, was a professor here at the university and uh, created the um, first public television and radio station here in Austin, indeed in the Southwest. And the, the very first job he had was to go to then Senator Johnson and get his permission uh, to do so because these, uh, these new radio and uh, television stations would have been in direct conflict with uh, the stations owned by uh, Senator Johnson, I, I should say, in the name of Lady Bird Johnson. Um, but you'll notice that he didn't go to Lady Bird to ask her permission. He went to Senator Johnson. And, and I'm pleased to say that he, he did, of course, give his permission, and not only that, but would go on in his uh, presidential career to sign into law the bill that created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So I, I have this kind of family connection. I don't... Um, I don't remember President Johnson personally, but uh, I asked uh, one of my older brothers um, if he did, and he said, well, yes, I, I remember a visit, and he said, I don't actually remember Senator Johnson so much. What I remember is how respectful our father was around this man, and uh, I always thought that was quite telling, but I, so I have this family connection, and then um, the... Uh, Johnson-Humphrey victory in, in 1964 is the very first political campaign that I remember that I was invested in emotionally, followed it closely, and cheered as loudly as anybody else at that landslide victory. And then, um, of course, only two years later, with uh, Vietnam ramping up and, and an older brother nearing draft age, um, I, I had a very different feeling about President Johnson. And then you know, 20 years later, as, a, as an artist in this country, trying to make a living and finding myself increasingly dependent upon social programs that, in fact, I realized had been put in place um, by President Johnson, I had yet a different feeling about him. And, uh, and now, having spent four or five years uh, researching this, I have such uh, respect for the complexity of this individual and for the tremendous uh, achievements uh, of his um, presidency, uh, and of course for, for the tragedies uh, that are part of that. So it was always a story um, that, I, that I was drawn to and that I thought needed to be told, uh, and I think particularly needed, needed to be told now. Why now? Well, you know, we are, um, we are approaching the anniversary of the, of the Voting Rights Act, uh, which, of course, was just gutted by the Supreme Court uh, a month ago. Uh, and, and already we're seeing a plethora of, uh, of states, not just in the South, but in the Midwest, beginning to change um, the standards by which one can vote. This was a battle that, that Lyndon Johnson fought fiercely uh, in 1965. Um, and here we are again, seemingly fighting the same battle. Um, Obamacare, uh, Medicare started under President Johnson. Here we are fighting again. And, and if you go back and you look at the, at the rhetoric at the time that was used to attack uh, Medicare, for example, it's shockingly similar to what you're hearing today. Um, we are ostensibly a post-racial society because Barack Obama is president. Of course, I don't believe that for a second. I doubt anybody in this room does. In fact, race matters as much as it ever has. And Lyndon Johnson was the very first president to really confront that issue in a big way with the passage of the 64 and 65 uh, Civil Rights Acts. So, and, and I think also we are, you know, we have a Congress that's gridlocked, uh, partisan politics being fought at the most bitter levels, and people look at Congress and they look at Washington and they say, why can't they get anything done? And we look back then at Lyndon Johnson and what he got done in his term, and it's astounding. And people look at that and think, how did he do that? Why can't we do that? So I, I think it's a, it's, the, the time is right uh, because of the issues that we continue to deal with. Um, the time is right to, for a reevaluation of President Johnson. Brian, you had just come off the, the triumph of playing Walter White in Breaking Bad. It could have been a, um, I'm going to Disney World moment, and instead you chose to take on this role. Why, why this one? Uh, partly because it frightened me, uh, the enormity of it. Uh, it was a tremendous challenge. Um, and I, I always knew in my early years as an actor in 
a variety of different acting classes that if I was a little bit frightened of something, it was a good sign. It was a good sign. And, and actors generally have to have that ability to, despite fear or anxiety, they dive into something. Um, you have to have that kind of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's ego or, or guts or stupidity or whatever it is, but you have to be able to, to want to take those opportunities and chances uh, to risk you know, falling on your face. Um, only then do you have the, the greatness. And I remember during the, uh, we did a run in, in Boston, and for the, for the month that we rehearsed, um, I, was, I was doggedly tired and um, fiercely devoted to getting this whole idea. And it wasn't just learning the lines, it was, it was taking in the, the spirit of this man and, and his sensibility and, and really understanding who he is and why he made these decisions and why he felt um, compelled to, to behave in, in such, uh, such a manner that was not always kind or considerate. And, um, and I looked over at our other actors, uh, 16 other actors in the company, and they were talking about uh, oh, how much fun they had last night at the bar or something, and they, they're doing crossword puzzles, or they're reading books, or they're listening to music, and, and I was just, I, I had none of that. It was, it was all in. But backstage, when they're ready to start the play and go, I was going, oh, I'm so glad I have this role. <laughs> it's right, you know, it's like yes, and so the payoff, yeah. the payoff comes. It's it's delayed gratification for sure, um, but there's definitely a payoff to it because it's it's a bigger than life character, and uh, and to jump into to Lyndon Johnson's shoes was is was a chance that I couldn't pass up. So, what were your impressions of LBJ before you took the role, not knowing that you would eventually play LBJ? Do you, you were seven years old when you took office. Yeah. So you probably have recollections as a child. But what what, what were your impressions of well, before my, doing this? You know, it's it's noted, but perhaps many people don't know this part of it. But um, Lyndon Johnson had a, had a public persona um, when he spoke to the press, and he that he put on. He felt it was more presidential if he had a, a more serious tone to it. Um, but he really wasn't that way at all. He was. A, a storyteller and a, a, a jokester, and and, a, and uh, he he was fun to be with. And then he could turn it and be very serious and very intent, and in your face and in your personal space. Um, I didn't know any of that when I was when I was a boy, and the and the assassination happened. Uh, it had an impact on me, a, a tremendous impact on me. Uh, not personally because I was only seven, so I I didn't quite understand why this happened or what it meant. Um, but I could see it reflected in my parents and all of the neighbors who huddled together, as many people did, and embraced each other and wept and, and consoled each other. And so I knew something was very important here, and I needed to pay attention. And so the president then was Lyndon Johnson. And listening to him and watching him, um, I always thought my impression of him was that he was a very soft-spoken, laconic, measured man. And that's what he wanted me to think and feel. But so it was a, a, a big surprise to learn little tidbits of it as I grew up. And he really wasn't that way, and 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 all the the stories about him. And then when I really started the research, I was on that I was on a roller coaster ride, finding out about <laughs> everything about Lyndon Johnson. Was there a great revelation in that uh, discovery process? What, was there one big revelation in that, in that discovery? Um, well, the first the first thing that I thought of when when I after I read Robert's script and fell in love with the the mastery of it and and the just the the, the wonderful con construction of the script itself to support the story of this man uh, and I believe I asked him at the time I said do you think that he was such a champion for the civil rights movement because he truly believed it? Or did he think that this was the, the political move to make and it would set his legacy? And, um, and we discussed that. And, and, and when I found out uh, 
more, you know, when I started my, my research, found out that he was in, in Catula, um, Texas, uh, teaching at a very, very poor school. And these kids who literally dirt poor, um, migrant farm worker kids, and didn't speak the English, and um, were, made the terrible mistake of being born poor. And the treatment that they received from the white people in the, in the town, and it, it resonated with Lyndon so deeply, the, the injustice of that, that because he, he knew them, he knew these kids, and they were eager to learn, and they obeyed, and they wanted to be taught, and, and to have them being derided and, and ridiculed and demeaned by people who didn't know them, it had a tremendous impact. And I think without that experience, he might not have been the absolute champion that he was for civil rights across the board. Robert, there are clear Shakespearean overtones in this play. Um, and Shakespeare, of course, borrowed from Tudor history for some of his historical tragedies. But I wonder, as a dramatist taking on a chapter in history, how do you tread the balance between making a, compelling, ma making a story a compelling drama and being faithful to history? Well, that's, that's the big challenge, of course. Um, first off, I have to be very clear that, that my job is very different from that of the historian. Um, the historian presumably is looking at the entirety of the event and all, all the individuals involved and all the factors involved and trying to arrive at some greater understanding of the, the entire sweep and scope of this event. Um, I say some objective, but of course that's not entirely the case. Every historian has their their bent. Um, but as a dramatist, as a dramatist, I am interested in history as source material for what it allows me to talk about, for the thematic concerns it allows me to explore. And 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 I should say, you know, this is not a this is not a new, even well beyond Shakespeare. You know, Aeschylus in 472 BC writes the very first history play, The Persians, um, about an event, a, an Athenian military victory that happens eight years previously. And you would think, well, okay, so it's going to be a little, you know, glorification of the Athenian state. And actually, what he does is very, is very interesting, and it's what you can do with history. He takes this event that everybody knows. Everybody knows this event. Everybody takes pride in. But his point of view on it is, well, let's look at this for what it might say about Athenian society today. What it might say, in looking at Xerxes, uh, the king of Persia, his uh, global ambitions, what it might say about our ambitions uh, as a democracy. That's the wonderful thing that you can do with history sometimes, is that you can have a conversation in the present about present day concerns that you might not be able to have so boldly, but by using the past, um, it permits you and an audience to enter into a discussion, a conversation about things that are happening right now, about issues that are important right now. And that was certainly the opportunity here. Um, uh, I was interested in power, politics, and morality. and. Uh, LBJ, 1960, November 1963 to 1964. Boy, this is where everything changes in this country. Everything changes in this country. And, uh, and you see, because we forget this, we forget this, we, we remember selectively, you see what it takes to get things done, really good things, what it costs. And it's important that we remember that. You know, we are so, we demand so much of our presidents. We expect so much. We are so easily and so quickly disappointed. It is a tough job. It is a tough job. And it's, it is to our benefit to remind ourselves of what it takes to get things done, what the cost is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what this story offered me the opportunity to explore. And I'm so grateful for it. There are clear parallels between uh, this play and King Lear. Do you see LBJ as a tragic figure? Um, I do ultimately, yes, I do. Not in this play, um, in all the way, November 63, November 64, the accidental presidency. What we watch is LBJ, 
who has spent his entire political career wanting, plotting, doing everything he could, wanting to be president so much, and suddenly he is president. Not, of course, in any way he would have wanted to become president. And that's a big, and that's a big issue for him. He's an accidental president. He's not really the president that got elected. And, um, and, and the question is, what, now that he's there, now that he has the power, what is it that LBJ really wants? And it turns out that what he really wants is civil rights. And in the course of this year, we see him fight for that bill and get that bill passed and fight for his own election, which will give him the legitimacy he so desperately wants. It's a drama. The sequel, if you will, called, which I am in the process of writing, called The Great Society, which will uh, open next year of its world premiere in um, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in July 2014. Have you no shame? Uh, none, none, none whatsoever. <laughs> I'm sorry. In fact, they're selling tickets in the back, and you can sign up. <clears throat> and, uh, um, Sell finger and dizement. Uh, and, uh, well, that's one of the lessons from LBJ. Don't be modest. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that, uh, that takes us, of course, from the, uh, the high water mark of that landslide victory and the tremendous success on the domestic agenda with the passage of bill after bill after bill in the Great Society programs, major bills, landmark bills, including, of course, the Voting Rights Bill of 1965 and then into the morass of Vietnam and, uh, and the tragedy of that. Um, and finally, his if you will, stepping away from the throne in March 1968 when he announces that he will not run. I, I do think it's tragic. I, I do. I do. It's a, tragedy requires consciousness. It requires awareness. There is that moment where the tragic hero has awareness of, of where they are and what they have done and what they have created, and I think he had that. I think that's why he made the choice it is. I mean, this is something that historians will debate from here to the end of time. Why did he resign. My choice, and it's my play, so it gets to, I get to decide. <laughs> my choice is that he recognized that the situation that he had created was untenable, and that the country was so riven um, that perhaps if he stepped aside, it might be possible for someone else to come in and make the peace that he so desperately wanted and so could not make. And so I, in fact, I, I see it as a noble gesture, actually. I do. Brian, uh, how do you create uh, a character based on a real-life figure versus a Walter White, where you create it based on you know, words on a script or, or meetings with writers? What's the, what, what's the difference between those two processes? Uh, the, well, the, the goal is, is ultimately the same, and that's to... to develop a sense of honesty so that you, you live in a plausible world, that when people watch your behavior, um, they believe it's possible, they believe it's true. Um, and in order to get the audience there, you have to get there yourself. So in this case, when it's uh, you know, a, a national, international figure, um, a lot of history to it, uh, there's still a lot of debate about uh, who the man was and what his motives were and things. And those are answers that um, can be useful and sometimes they can't be useful. Um, so my job uh, as an actor developing a character is to be like a huge whale and just open the mouth and everything, shove everything in and find the process. It's a little, uh, it's a little crude the way I'm saying it, but, but basically it's to, it's to be open to it, to, to receive it. And the more you take in and then you, you let it sit there and, and sometimes you get overload if you continue to. So you have to take out the trash and things that you go, I don't know if that really helps me. I need to make more space in my head so you let it go and you keep assembling and sometimes you go wait a minute I, I do need that I'm gonna take that back and you know and it's it's mixing and matching and it's formulating an idea and I, all I can say it's 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 based a lot on your instincts um, and your instincts then are determined uh, by 
what, what your influences are. So if you're going to the, to the right source material, uh, and we had a, a terrific dramaturg, Tom Bryant, on the, on the play, and, and he uh, created a lot of opportunities. Your book was very helpful, and uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book. A little louder. This uh, is a Mark Updegrove, yeah. <laughs> very, very helpful book, uh, Mark Updegrove. <laughs> On sale now. I heard um, good things about self-aggrandizing yeah. a couple of minutes. Um, and so you just take it all in and then formulate and get a sensibility of the character. I didn't want to do uh, an impression. I don't, I don't want that. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to really understand the man and what he feared and what he loved and what he wanted and what he disdained and once you do those broad strokes, then you can be a little more uh, subtle in, in what you're taking in as well. And then you start to form it. And basically, it, it, when you're creating a character, whether it's Walter White or Lyndon Johnson, it's outside of you because you haven't really been introduced yet. And your goal is to, to get the sense that that character now is embodied in you so that when something happens or when says so, someone says something or I read a script, I'm breaking bad, it filters through Walter's head and his sensibility. When I read rewrites on the play, it's now hopefully filtering through my sensibility of Lyndon Johnson. And, and it has to pass a, 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 a test, a rigorous test. So there, during the rehearsal process, there's tremendous uh, discussion with the playwright. Fortunately, he was with us the whole way and our director, and the dramaturgs, and the other actors. And a lot of the time, you're dealing with uh, subjective material. So you just have to take a stab at something. Um, like Robert said, he's writing pieces of, of material that uh, conveyed the intention. But he wasn't privy in, in the motel rooms with, the, um, with Martin Luther King and what was discussed, actually. But he had to imagine what, what that was like. So in, in, in aspect, we had the same job. His instincts told him what to write. My instincts tell me how I present him physically, vocally, and emotionally. We have, we have the same job and, we, and, and the same challenges, which is that uh, you know, we have two hours and 40 minutes to tell our tale. You know, we, we don't, we're not Bob Caro. We're not producing a 1,000, 2,000 page book every eight, nine years to exhaustively detail this happened, this happened, and this happened. We don't have that. And, and a book, of course, you can put down. Well, I, I don't want you to put this play down in the audience. I, I want to keep you riveted. So, so just from the very beginning, there's only so much you can tell. And already, by the process of selectivity forced on you by circumstances, you are not saying other things. You are not telling other things. So you're making choices all the time, all the time, and, and making decisions about what you're going to include, what you're not going to include, and how you are going to tell this story. And the, the challenge, I think, because of course it, it is a work of fiction. Um, I am... I play fast and loose with chronology. I write scenes that didn't necessarily happen or didn't happen this way. I put people in rooms that weren't there, and I write dialogue that wasn't said. Um, You're a phony. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, How dare you? But, but, but yeah. skillful, skillful. <laughs> um, I believed you. But the, 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 the important thing, I think, is that you don't cross a line with the the inherent truth of these people. And I do think there is a line. I do think there is a line. Um, you know, as, as much of a fan I am of say, someone like Oliver Stone, who I think is an immensely talented film director, and some of his biographical picks, I think he crosses a line. You from, from establish that truth, though, Robert, in the research that you do. How do you, how do you draw that line? Obviously, it's something that's subjective. It point. is subjective. So how do you do it? I, you know, I, I, the, the question I, I, I ask myself when I put is, can I genuinely believe that the character I have created is acting in a way or saying something that I can imagine was actually said or done by this individual? And can I substantiate that 
by my research, by the people I have, I have talked to. I mean, there have been so many uh, individuals here that, that you have put me in touch with, for example, who had the pleasure uh, of working with LBJ and to talk to them and ha listen to their stories, the wealth of material that is available, both in terms of biographical or in raw material, just the pure stacks and stacks of material that is here. Um, I, I mean, you could spend a lifetime in this, but it's, it's, it's trying to take the best of that, the most compelling, the thing that, that rings true to your sensibility, that, that has that sense that yes, that feels right to me. And yes, that is, of course, entirely subjective. Yeah, um, his, his job basically, he knew the, where it goes. His history tells us those markers are set. When he took office, when this legislation was passed, and so Robert's job is to entertainingly write the map. Mm -hmm. He actually has to create a map of how these things connect and the connective tissues to each one of these things. And there's guideposts along the way, but it's blank, basically. There are, there, there are some speeches that are a public record and that you could draw from, um, firsthand accounts. Uh, and if that's helpful, but you still have to be able to draw it. And the other thing I would say is that our first responsibility truly is to entertain, mm -hmm. not, not to make any bones about it. It's to entertain. We, we don't want, and we don't have in all the way, for sure, no one leaves the theater uh, you know, disappointed. I mean, we're very proud of that. But we would not be able to mount this play if everything was absolutely true but boring as hell. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, we, it just doesn't work. So we have an obligation to entertain, and yet I think a responsibility as well to, to absorb the sensibility of the characters and the true nature of that. And, and that was part of the discussion, yeah. deep uh, and heavy. For example, the, um, you know, we actually have the tape recordings of some, uh, many of these phone conversations that LBJ had. We have tape recordings of the conversations he had with the governors of Mississippi, governor of Mississippi after the three civil rights workers go missing during Freedom Summer. We, we have that, and you know, it goes on for quite some time. It's somewhat rambling, you know, but if you listen carefully, there's some really very precise and sharp maneuvering. So my job as the writer is to reduce that dialogue to that and then to, to hand it to uh, an actor as talented as Brian here who really finds the way to perform that for the audience so they get it. They see how LBJ is working this individual in this moment, this very complicated political and personal tragic moment, how he's working this individual and how he feels about this individual, how he shifts his tactics midway in terms of how he deals with him. And, and it's so, this is the thing that theater can do that a history book can't do for you. Suddenly he becomes alive in that moment and politics, the, the, the sausage making of it, the blood and the gristle of it comes alive and you see how it's that personal connection, how it's the use of language, how it's the skillful interjection, the question poised just so naturally to provoke the response that you want. Um, that's what theater can do right. that a history book can't do for you. Right. I think also you, look, you think back of the, of the best teachers you ever had and there was probably a healthy dose of theatricality to them. Mm -hmm. They brought it to life. They made a subject that you may have thought previously to be dull and all of a sudden you go home and say, I like history, you know, why? Because that teacher lit a fire under you. And teachers have to, they're, they're the first actors. I mean, they're the ones who, who really have to put on a performance mm -hmm. to draw that audience and get that audience of theirs uh, interested in that subject. They need to tell a compelling story. A compelling story. So you said something today that I thought was very instructive. You, you talked about the importance of finding the emotional core of the characters that you play. And you talked about how and Malcolm yeah. in the Middle, to yeah. talk a little bit about that and how you found Howe's emotional core. <laughs> so to speak. How, I, um, well, it, it's, it goes back to, the, to an actor's job, and, and for me, personally, the, the more I know about a character, the more I discover about him, the more comfortable I feel about 
portraying him. So Hal and Malcolm in the middle, uh, I didn't know what to do. The, the character only had uh, three or four lines in the pilot episode. And, and so I made one distinction that yet he was he was not disinterested in his family. He loved his family, but he can be distracted. He had to take little mental vacations away from all the, the energy of the boys. Um, but he, his basic uh, emotional core was fear. He was afraid of everything. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he, he was afraid of being a bad husband. He was afraid of losing his job. He was, af- he was afraid of heights. He was afraid of spiders. He was afraid of people. You know. And, and, and from there, you could, you could see where a, a, a comedic growth can go. Um, and, uh, and, I was have, and then the same thing, where you go to Breaking Bad, I had a very difficult time finding his emotional core until I realized that Walter White was numb. He didn't know what he felt. He had no feeling. He was so calloused over. And so I thought, oh, and that led me to depression. And I realized, oh, that's where he is. He's a depressed man. And in a, in a broad stroke, and what I was looking into, um, <clears throat> depression can, can, uh, can manifest broadly, either <clears throat> externally or internally. You either you see the people who are depressed and they're lashing out. That son of a bitch! If I wasn't for him, I would have been so much better off in my life. Or my ex-wife did this, or you know. And they get angry and they and they send that energy out, or they implode. And that's what happened to Walt. He imploded. He became invisible to himself and to others. And that's why I wanted him to have no color in his skin. We took the color out of my hair when I had hair. I, I grew a mustache. I wanted to grow a mustache that I, that I wanted to reflect as impotence. <laughs> so if you want to know how to grow an impotent mustache, because <laughs> I know there's a lot of men out there going, yes, I was just thinking about that the other day. I want to grow an impotent mustache. I know how to do it. Uh, and I gained weight so that I had fat going over my underwear, and I stayed with tidy whitey underwear because it seemed like a boy, and he, he gave up. Walt gave up. He didn't advance. He didn't care anymore. And so by the visual impact of seeing him that way, I think the audience went, oh, this man is lost somewhere and walking through life uh, without really knowing that he's doing it. And, and yet you could, you, you could still love and you could still have dreams and desires. And then when this awful thing of this uh, cancer diagnosis came to him, he made a, a huge leap to be this, you know, this drug dealer. Uh, you know, a mistake. <laughs> big, big mistake. <laughs> big mistake. However, <laughs> um, but he, he, um, he, at least in the last two years of his life, he was alive. Right. And that was the thing. So you get to, to Lyndon Johnson. Well, now it's just massive. And you have the responsibility of a living person. People say, well, no, no, he didn't look like that. He looked like that. Here's how he looked. So you, you don't have control in shaping everything, certainly physically. Uh, and I wish I was taller. I'm six. I'm six, and I wear lifts when I play him. Don't tell anybody. Uh, that gets me up to six, two. Uh, but I wish I had your height to begin with. That would be good. Uh, what, did, when you're trying to find that core, is it an epiphany, or does it come through a longer process uh, as you're getting to know the character? It could be either, and you're open to anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you don't know when something is going to resonate within you. Um, we had a, a dinner not too long ago with Harry Middleton and Larry Temple, and, and just in casual conversation, Larry said something that really resonated with me, as did Harry. But, um, It was interesting because it was offhanded about um, how every day except Sunday, is it all right to tell this, Larry? Okay. Um, (laughs) He would dress up as a woman and go. uh, (laughs) No? Oh, not that one? Oh, okay, not that one. Okay. All right. And apparently he put on an impotent mustache. Mm -hmm. I understand. Is that that correct? Take on a high voice. No. Um, Not that one. No, I won't tell that one. Okay. Um, No, Larry uh, was the president's counsel uh, in the the last year and a half or so of his administration. And he would uh, go to the White House every day except Sunday, 7.30 in the morning, and go to the president's bedroom where the president was already up, usually, drinking this milky white tea and, drink, and reading, reading copiously 
uh, all the papers he can get a hold of. And, and, and he was talking about that as just a general nature of who the man was. And it struck me. And I, I thought, well, you're his counsel. And, and uh, I said, was there, what, was there legal issues to be dealt with every single morning at 7.30 in the morning, it seemed? And, and Larry said, I, you know, there was a, there was a trust factor. And, and, and there was also a sense that, that he conveyed that Lyndon Johnson liked the company and liked to have familiar faces and trustworthy people around him. And, he, and, and that was one thing that led me to the next thing, which I found, is that he hated being alone. I started then, from that little bit, I started to, now I want to find out more. And uh, from Doris Kearns Goodwin, I found out that, oh, he hated being alone, and often would say, would you, can you wait outside the, the room you know, while I sleep? And it's like, wow. All these interesting things, you know, do, can you do your work? I'll set up a desk here. Can you do your work just outside the door? And it's like, interesting how he, this man of great power and great ambition and yet hated the fact of being alone. And that could be traced back. Now I'm going back his mother, Rebecca, uh, and I wanted to go back to find out what she was like and where this came from, where this feeling came from of, of not wanting to be alone and you never know if it's going to be useful information, but you're on a track like a detective, and you start uncovering things and reading things, and it's, it's a fascinating uh, part of, of my work that I get to do, is to um, a new case every time. So the next character I play, I have another, I have to launch into another person to find out who that guy is. It's almost like being a member of CSI. You know, it's always like the crime scene. You gotta find out, retrace the steps to find out who they really were. Robert, what impression do you want to leave audiences with when they, when they leave all the way? Well, um, you know, I'd like them to be, uh, to have learned something, of course, about the time and these events. But, but more than anything, I'd, I'd like them to come away with a lot of questions. I, I don't believe in a playwright giving a lot of answers. What I believe is posing a lot of questions, the kind that wake you up in the middle of the night a couple of days later thinking, why would he do that? Or what would I do in that situation? Or, you know, does that make him a good man or a bad man? Um, the, the issues are, are so complex. I mean, LBJ, as you hear you know, Brian talking about, it, was such a complicated individual, such a, such a mix of conflicting uh, qualities and traits, uh, values. And, um, and what I want is the audience to think about power and morality. I want them to think about what it takes to get things done and, and where the line is. Where, where should we draw that line? Um, you know, is, can something be so good in its ultimate value that it's permissible to do anything to bring that into being? Is, 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 does, that the great, does the end justify the means or not? And, and how should we evaluate those situations, because they matter. They matter keenly. They continue to resonate today in everything we do. You know, we get very, we get very frustrated with Washington. We get very frustrated with the Capitol here. You know, but those decisions, those decisions that are being made every day affect people in profound ways. It matters, and we need to pay attention. So, you know, I, I want to entertain them, certainly, but I want to provoke them. I want to send them off thinking about this arguing about it, you know, moved to reflect on what it should mean to them and, and, and how they should respond to that. That, that I think, is what we're, what mm. we're really trying to do in, I, in the evening. I think the key thing that he's saying is that it's, it's not up to us uh, to put that emotion to you. Uh, we are tremendously respectful of an audience, and, and whatever you truly feel after you see this play is right is how you feel. There's no denying that. And all we care about is that it triggers an emotion. And I was mentioning this the other day, uh, a couple, couple hours ago, I said, the only failure that we have as a creative team is if we bore you. If we put you to sleep, if you have no emotional response whatsoever, we've lost. We've lost it because we haven't connected with you. And so any other emotion is really fair. You could, you could leave this play and be angry. You could leave it and go, wow, that was fantastic. Or I'm confused. Or anything is all right, really. 
Um, just not, just not that other one. I won't even say it again. <laughs> oh. Robert, what can we expect with uh, All the Way's sequel, The Great Society, which you're writing right now? Um, well, it, it, as I say, we'll pick up where All the Way leaves off um, uh, in November 1964, and um, sort of the it's in th it will be in three acts, uh, and and the first act is is largely. Uh, about the voting rights passage of the voting rights bill, so it's uh, it's Selma, uh, Pettus Bridge, Bloody Sunday, um, uh, and the throwdown between Governor Wallace uh, and and LBJ, uh, which is a, a marvelous scene in and of itself, um, and the the passage of of the voting rights bill, and then um, on top of which he's also passing Medicare and educate the massive education bill and. Clean air, clean water. I mean, just one after another, major uh, progressive legislation, um, while simultaneously the American public and and the Congress are being misled about what is happening in Vietnam, uh, and the and the terrible juggling act that um, the president faces, knowing because he knows and he knows early on that Vietnam will eat up, and he says this. He says has said this to several people at different times, that Vietnam will eat up everything I'm trying to do domestically, but he can't see a way out, and so he keeps doubling down, hoping that you know he'll get lucky and maybe there'll be a settlement, and then he can get to the things that really matter. So we watch this begin to percolate. We see the civil rights movement move north, and suddenly. From the high water mark of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, suddenly in Chicago, civil rights reaches the stone wall. And, and, and what that is, and it's a, you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's the not in my backyard, um, essentially. Northern liberals who are very, very happy to see the South um, change their egregious policies of Jim Crow are suddenly talking out of the other side of their mouth when it comes to integrating their neighborhoods and integrating their schools, and you have this tremendous pushback suddenly, um, which uh, the Republican Party is beginning to capitalize on. This is the emergence of the Southern strategy. There's a terrible midterm where much of what Lyndon has gained in the 64 election is suddenly lost. Now we're approaching uh, the presidential election, the question is always on the back of his mind, is Bobby going to run, is Bobby going to run, is Bobby going to run? The casualties in Vietnam are mounting up daily. Tet, uh, which shocks the country, which has been told that we are just about to win, and then clearly we are not just about to win. Um, all of this tremendous pressure, unbelievable pressure coming to bear as we see Everything he has built domestically now being stripped away from him as the party in opposition begins to find his weakness, as, as the economy begins, is the club with which you, you use to beat the great society to death. Um, and, and finally, this culminating in this, this moment where he makes, he comes to some kind of awareness about this, in, in, in my point of view, and makes this decision to step away and let somebody else come in and try to resolve the issue that he can't resolve. It's it's a um, believe me, it's it, it's a great ride. Um, it's a very powerful, very passionate, and I think ultimately very moving uh, evening of the theater. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to Mr. Cranston, uh, perhaps. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> I had the great luck of seeing uh, All the Way when it was uh, in Cambridge uh, in its last run. And uh, I can tell you that it's worth your while seeing when it comes to New York, when it goes to New York. Um, but Brian's performance is truly a tour de, tour de force. It's also a feat of endurance. You're on stage for two hours and 40 minutes in an extraordinarily demanding role. How do you prepare physically for that? Uh, <clears throat> Meth, right? M meth, crystal methamphetamine. <laughs> <laughs> How we all laugh about drug taking. <laughs> um, well, it's it, it was it was something that was I was very concerned about because it is um, a mammoth role and it requires all of my attention and focus and and I realized early on that in order to do that. 
I had to have my body support me. So I went on a strict diet and um, you know, very took out the carbs and I was I just I didn't eat spicy foods very much and I was, you know, I cut out everything. I, w I was no fun. I was no fun <laughs> for a month. Um, and and spicy just foods. spicy foods, yeah. Why? Because you don't want to be on stage and go, I <laughs> 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 Oh that. Or else, <laughs> or else get get an attack the other way and go. Excuse me, I'll be right back. <laughs> Talk to the people while I'm gone. <laughs> They're nice folks. Uh, <laughs> There's practical applications here. You want to be pragmatic as you're in your choices. Uh, and also, uh, tomato base is not, is not good for the system. Uh, just like creams, you don't want to drink milks and cheeses and things like that that con congest in your sinuses and, and, and you know, prevent you from having clear passage because I'm, I'm breathing like a bull on stage and I'm sweating. And I, every, I change my T-shirt underneath each time, twice, did I say twice? <laughs> twice. Yeah. Twice. It's the math. I think. Um, so uh, it was. It was just. It, it, I, I just felt it needed the stamina. And even though um, President Johnson uh, battled his weight, I feel. I felt that this is something that I need to do in order to sustain. And that was just a month. Now we're going into a New York run that I will be performing uh, before an audience, eight shows a week. Uh, for five months, and uh, and and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but <laughs> and I, you know, so I was starting to lose my voice at the end of the first day, and Robert gave me a great tip, and I I did that. I went through the script and I I marked, I highlighted uh, all the places that I remember during the performance where I elevated my voice and got into it and started yelling and screaming, and so I highlighted all those to to see physically see where that is and see if there was an alternative way to keep the same intention and intensity but bring it down so that I don't strain the voice so much. Or as singers know, a way to open the voice sometimes to where I can open it um, and, and still sound natural. So it's a challenge and uh, I'm, I'm going to start uh, working with a, a vocal coach uh, right away and, and just strengthen the voice and open it, and again get my body ready for this this battle. It's it's, it's going to be it's, it's going to be all, tough. We've all the entire company design and the acting company, you know, we're gearing up for for this this final leg here on Broadway, and uh, uh, you know, you've heard what the the kind of physical regimen that that Brian is going to be putting himself through to prepare for this. Um, the design elements will change. Uh, I've I have rewritten. Uh, the last 15 pages of the play. This, I've been working on this play for four years now. It's been, it's had two major productions, and I and I have rewritten the end and maybe gotten it right this time. You know, I mean, um, we all want to bring our best to the table here. But that's an interesting point you bring up because, as an artist, not dissimilar from a painter or a sculptor, when is the work done? <clears throat> when do you know that this is it? And you know, I mean, does I, I think the, the the famous statement about that is that plays are never finished; they're just abandoned. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, there's some truth to that because you can you know you can keep working and working and working. It's sort of like Zeno's arrow. You know, I mean, you'll never quite get to the mark. Yeah. Um, but with this company, with Brian, and we had we surrounded him with an extraordinary company of actors. We we're very fortunate, uh, many of whom will be coming uh, with us to New York. You know, when you're in a room with, with, with people that talented and that smart, you know, when they're working a scene, questions are going to come up. Why this? I don't understand this. How, how, how does this, this seems contradictory or confusing. I have to be on my toes the entire time. I have to be thinking. And, and to be pushed in that way is a very good thing. It's a very good thing. It results in me rethinking. And sometimes, sometimes I, I can explain. Oh, this is what I'm. This is what I'm after. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes there's something wrong in the text, and I need to. It's my job to attend to that. Mm -hmm. So throughout the rehearsal process in Boston, I, I made constant revisions during rehearsal. Mm -hmm. You know, a line here, a line there, because these were smart actors. These were good actors, and when they constantly hit a place and have a problem, 
that means I need to pay attention. That means it's probably on me and I need to pay attention. So it, it's been a, a really exciting process, a very p deeply, deeply pleasurable one. And, and I think we're all really, really looking forward to, to taking this to, to the final step here onto Broadway. Let me talk for a moment about your extraordinary careers. <clears throat> Brian, you achieved superstardom uh, in, in your early 50s. And I'm wondering, did, did uh, uh, achieving that level of fame require an adjustment on your part? Uh, yeah, there, you, you never, I never thought of becoming a, a star, and, and it was never a desire of mine. Um, I loved acting. I still do. I love what it, how it empowers me, uh, affecting an audience by what you say, and um, and so that was my my goal. And I achieved that when I was 25 years old, became an, a working actor, and and never had another job from that point on. Um, at some point, I. I was always resisting the sensibility of, of the word star and what it meant to me. And I was actually taking on what it meant to others. And I realized, well, that's foolish because I don't have to do that. And so I was spending a lot of energy trying to push the boulder back up the hill as opposed to letting it go wherever it's supposed to go. I mean, that's the actor's life anyway. We really don't know where our careers are going to go. Um, we hope that we have opportunity, and that's that's what ultimately the word star became synonymous with me is opportunity it is open doors and and so i don't resist it anymore when someone says here's the star or you're a star it's like okay hey <laughs> <laughs> but i know what it means to me it doesn't mean that i'm going to change my lifestyle or want to ditch anything that helped me achieve who i am in a foundational sense uh, happily married, 25 years next year, and uh, thank you. And uh, five years with my girlfriend too. So <laughs> we have there's there's longevity there. And uh, um, uh, <laughs> that's hard for me to keep straight. I, 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 um, but it's it's been a it's been a fun ride and 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 that's what it means to me. It means opportunity and so I'm I'm picking and choosing projects now that are challenging and interesting and and at the core they have they're well written material. You and I have spoken about your parents. Your parents were both actors. Yeah. Uh, and you saw their careers sort of wax and and wane. Yeah. And you decided not to get into acting until much later. In fact, you wanted to be a policeman. Yes. You thought about being a cop. What, what drove you into acting? Uh, girls. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Girls is the reason that I became an actor. <laughs> I, was, I was going to college studying police science. I thought that was my path. And uh, in an elective course, I took acting and stagecraft. And the girls in theater arts were far prettier than the ones in police science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 19 years old, so I was like, "Now what do I do?" And it really it spun me around. It really did, and it, it made me reflect on well, why, if 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 something as apparently trivial as as a pretty girl can change my mind, was I that? Was I that intent on becoming a policeman in the first place? I think not. I think maybe better to play a policeman on television <laughs> and get the pretty girls. <laughs> so that's kind of that's kind of what I did. It's the truth. I'm not really proud of that, but uh, but that's that's what that's the decision making of a 19 year old boy. Right? Sounds about right. Sounds about right, doesn't it? Yeah. Robert, what did uh, winning the Pulitzer Prize do for you? Um, well, it was a, a tremendous validation for the work that I was doing as a writer. I, I was, uh, I, I had not trained formally as a writer. Uh, I had always written, um, and um, but had had found myself increasingly moving away from a career as an actor because Brian had taken all the girls, and so. 
um, it, uh, towards that of a writer. And um, with the Kentucky Cycle, for the first time, I, uh, I had quit my day job, essentially, which was acting. And, and I had a wife and uh, a small child, at that, my, my daughter, who's here with us tonight. And um, I, I actually quit my job to focus on this big, enormous play that everybody was sort of shaking their heads over about, well, how are you going to get that produced? And um, it, was, it was really a kind of blind leap of faith. And, and the success of the play, first and foremost, in, in terms of what it did with an audience, in terms of the audience response to this piece of theater that I had created, which was so deeply and profoundly satisfying. But then to, to have it recognized in this way by my peers um, was uh, tremendously gratifying. And of course, it, it also puts a target on your back. You know. But does it allow you to take more chances as an artist to be to get validation like that? Um, you know, I, actually, I didn't write another play for a couple of years. It took me a couple of years to to find my way to that. Um, were, you, were you intimidated by the sense of winning this enormous? Hmm. Uh, well, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, not so much a, the the prize itself, but my experience in New York was was, was very ambivalent. Um, it, it was this tremendous success, and, and yet not so much critically. Uh, in New York, it was very confusing, very confusing time, and um, it took me a while to sort of find my my way back to that. Um, and and it's interesting to me that now, at this stage in my career, uh, I, and instead I went and wrote a lot of television, a lot of film. Um, uh, where I, I could indeed support my family, which I can never do as a playwright. I don't know any playwright who can support his family in this country on what, on what you might earn in the theater. <clears throat> and, but eventually I, I came back to it, and um, uh, as a result of, of the intervention of friends, basically, who said, you know, I'll commission you. I'd, I'd love to see, you know, what have you got? And I had this play, and, and they put it on, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm back. And so now, at, at this age, to be back in theater, to be back in theater like this and feeling so passionate uh, about this material and so excited about what's happening, there, there are three, three times that you, you get to feel great when you write a play. One is, one is in your office, in the privacy of this world, in your head, where you create this entire thing, this entire thing is there in your head. And then the second time is in the rehearsal room where you begin this collaborative process which is wonderful and terrifying and intimidating all in one thing. There's all these amazing artists come in and, and they've all got their things that they're bringing to it and they're asking you questions and demanding answers and, and the stakes suddenly get very real and very high and, and, and you really, you really you're, you're being pushed and challenged and you really want to see this thing and it's beginning to take shape in the room and it's a wonderful give and take and it's deeply, deeply satisfying. And then the last is when you are finally in front of an audience of strangers, a group of people have assembled who've never seen this work before, it's new to them, and you stand in the back and, and the lights go down. You're standing in the back of this auditorium and you're looking up and you see all these lights, all, all this technical equipment, and behind all the technical equipment are all these people that the audience, of course, never sees that are running this. And then you know they're the, the actors here, they're preparing and they're coming on stage. And then this story happens. This story happens that was just in your head in your room and now it's happening in real time and real space in front of an audience. And there is something that happens between the people on stage, the storytellers, and the people in the audience who are here hearing the story and it becomes a shared event, it becomes a communal event and for this one amazing moment we are all reliving this story as though it was just happening for the first time and there is nothing as good as that. Mm -hmm. There is nothing as good as Nicely that. Put. Yeah. All right. For me, it's for the girls. <laughs> All that highfalutin stuff. Uh, our audience is comprised uh, of <clears throat> roughly half, half of them are students. Um, I wonder, is, is there advice that you impart to them if they are contemplating a career as a screenwriter or as a playwright? Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's really it. I mean, I, well, uh, one other piece of advice I'll give. Um, but the idea that um, you're in it 
And it's a long, this can take as long as it takes. And, and if you put the pressure on yourself to succeed immediately or to achieve immediately, you're going to be very disappointed and very broken, ultimately. So it's a marathon, not a script, not a sprint. And then the, the, um, the best advice I ever got as an actor, which I think is the best advice I ever got, period, was here at the University of Texas in the Department of Drama by Jagien Kazic, who was a marvelous Polish uh, acting instructor, um, a, a contemporary of Czeslek and Malak, mm. who somehow we had the great good fortune to wind up here in Austin, Texas. And as an actor, I was very intense. I could, probably because I was more a writer, I could so see what the moment needed to be. I so knew what it should look like and how it should sound and how it should smell, and I would work so hard. And she would tear her hair, Yaga, she would say, Robert, Robert, you must leave something for God. <laughs> and she was right, of course. She was right. I was trying to control it too much. I was trying, I was squeezing the magic out of it. I was squeezing the life out of it. And as soon as I understood what that meant and accepted it, I was so much better off. So th that's my advice, my two bits of advice. Brian, what counsel would you offer those considering a career in acting? Uh, I would say that if, this, if there's other things in life that you, you feel that could make you happy, pursue that. <laughs> uh, and I mean that, because, because as Robert said, so in, in the sister form of, of uh, storytelling, acting, um, it's, it's not about an achievement of some plateau or level or something, because that, I can tell you, that constantly moves and changes. So when you think you, oh, I finally, what, what happened to it? It's now not what you thought it was. So you can't fixate on a point, except when you're doing your waiter's job, which I had many, uh, loading trucks and, oh my God, I had so many things. I was a, I was a video date. Uh, interviewer, a dating service. Uh, yeah, uh, I did everything. Always the girls. Yeah, always the girls. <laughs> now I'm forever marked. Always the girls. Yeah. Um, no, I gave that up weeks ago. But, uh, but I knew that what got me through is the desire to become a working actor. That was the only plateau that I ever really reached for that I could say, this is what I do for a living. <clears throat> I act for a living. And that was a huge achievement for me. And from there, I just was loose. Like, like Robert said, L leave it, be faithful. Let, let, it, let it move you. Um, actors rely on instinct, so do writers. And so allow that to happen. But you have to commit to this. This is not something, you know, I laugh at, at people who say, well, I'm gonna give it a year. I'll give it a year, and uh, boy, if I, you know, I should, by a year, I should achieve, you know, I should get my own show or a Broadway show or in a year. Uh, those are fools. Stay away from those people, too, because they'll, they'll just trip you up. You have to love it. Love what you do. And if you love it, then you have to try it. You have to try. Uh, but there's, there's a couple things that you'll need. You'll need talent. Don't forget that. Don't, you know, when you go to New York or California, bring that with you. Um, you have to be persistent and you have to have patience and the X factor. You have to get lucky. There is no career that was ever made without luck. You talk to anyone who has had a successful career or is having a successful career, and if they think about it, they'll put, oh, you know what? That's true. I was on in the open door and I was able to, you know. And luck, preparation meets opportunity. We've heard that before, and it's true. That keep working on your craft, keep working on your artistry. And when you get that break, you're ready. You're ready for it. Uh, and good luck. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> you ha heard Larry Temple earlier this evening talk about what a distinguished lectureship this is. We've had some remarkable people on this stage under the auspices of the lecture. And Larry mentioned that it was the, the best lecture of its kind in the United States. If you didn't believe that before, I know you'll believe it now. Robert, Brian, thank you for a very memorable evening. This was thank, you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.